Professor Chomsky, I'd like to press you a little bit further about the way in which uh, effective democratic control would be achieved consistently with uh, discharging the necessary functions of such a society. If you suppose that uh, there would continue to be a need for self-defense um, on quite a sophisticated level, mm. um, I don't quite see from your description how you would achieve effective control by the system of part-time uh, representative uh, councils at various levels from the bottom up over an organization as, as powerful and uh, as necessarily technically sophisticated as, for example, the Pentagon, which is a body with which you've had a, quite a long record of mm -hmm. conflict over the Vietnam War and other matters in uh, recent years. Can you describe how uh, the uh, Pentagon could, at one and the same time, be efficient as a defense organization and nonetheless properly responsive to democratic control within the United States if it wasn't an anarchist society? Well, first, we should be a little clear, clear about terminology. You refer to the Pentagon, as is usually done, as a defense organization. And, in fact, uh, I remember very well in 1947 when the uh, National Defense Act was passed that established the uh, current system of war making, uh, the former War Department, the, the American Department uh, concerned with war at that period, up to that time, was the Army Department, honestly yeah. the War Department, yeah. and it had branches. And its name was changed in that act to the Defense Department. And any sophisticated uh, person, and I don't, I was a student then and didn't think I was very sophisticated, but I knew and everyone knew that this meant that to whatever extent that the American military had been involved in defense in the past, and partially it had been, so this was now over. Since it was being called the Defense Department, that meant it was going to be a Department of Aggression, nothing well, else. The principle of never and believe anything because it's officially denied. Right, sort of uh, on the assumption that Orwell essentially had captured the nature of the modern state. Uh, and that's exactly the case. I mean, the Pentagon is in no sense a defense department. It's not, it has never defended the United States from anyone. It has only served to uh, conduct aggression. Uh, and uh, I think that the American people would be much better off without a Pentagon. I don't, they certainly don't need it for defense. I think its intervention in, in international affairs has never been, well, you know, never is a strong word, but I think you, can, you would be hard put to find a case. Certainly it has not been its characteristic uh, posed to support uh, freedom or liberty or uh, to defend people uh, uh, and, and so on. That's not the role of the of the massive uh, military organization that is controlled by the Defense Department. Rather, its its tasks are are two, both quite antisocial. Uh, the first is to uh, preserve an international system in which what are called American interests, which primarily means business interests, can flourish. And secondly, uh, it has an internal economic task. I mean, the Pentagon has been the primary Keynesian mechanism whereby uh, the government intervenes to uh, maintain what is ludicrously called the health of the economy by, uh, by, its, uh, by uh, inducing production. That means production of waste. Now, both of, those, uh, both of those functions serve certain interests, in fact, dominant interests, class inter dominant class interests in American society, but uh, don't think that they in any sense serve the the public interest, and I would think that uh, that this system of uh, production of waste and of destruction would essentially be dismantled in a libertarian society. Now, one shouldn't be too glib about this. If, let's say, a uh, well, if, if one can imagine, let's say, a social revolution in the United States, that's rather distant, I would assume. But if that took place, it's hard to imagine that there would be any uh, credible enemy from the outside that could threaten that social revolution. Uh, we wouldn't be attacked by Mexico or uh, you know, uh, Hawaii or something like that. Uh, well, it's a part of the United States, Cuba, let's say. Uh, the, the, uh, an American revolution would, be, uh, would, would not require, I think, defense against aggression. On the other hand, if a libertarian social revolution were to take place, say, in Western Europe, then I think the problem of defense would be very critical. I was going to say, I mean, it, it cannot surely be inherent in the anarchist idea that there should be no self-defense because such anarchist experiments as there have been have on the record right. actually been destroyed from oh, it without. Is not, yeah. uh, but let, I think that these questions have to be, cannot be given a general answer. They have to be answered specifically relative to specific, or specific uh, histor historical and objective conditions. Yeah, it's just that I found a little difficulty in following before the break your description of uh, the proper democratic control right. of this kind of an organization on the basis that the defense 
organization itself would become some kind of uh, workers cooperative and I wouldn't because say that. I find it a little hard to see no, the generals no. controlling themselves in right. a manner which you would approve of well that's why I, 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 I do want to point out the complexity of the issue mm. it depends on the country and the society and uh, that we're talking about in the United States one kind of problem arises if there were a libertarian social revolution in Europe then I think the problems you raise would be very serious because there would be a serious problem of defense that is I would assume that if libertarian socialism were achieved at some level in Western Europe, there would be a direct military threat, both from the Soviet Union and from the United States. And the problem would be how that should be countered. Uh, that's the problem that was faced by the Spanish Revolution. There, there was a direct military intervention by, uh, well, really three-pronged, by fascists, by communists, and by the liberal democracies uh, in the background. And the question how one can defend oneself against attack at this level is a very serious one. Uh, however, I think uh, we have to raise the question whether centralized standing armies uh, with uh, uh, high technology deterrence are the most effective way to do that. And that's by no means obvious. Uh, for example, I don't think that a Western European centralized army would itself deter, say, a Russian-American attack to prevent libertarian socialism, the kind of attack that I would quite frankly expect at some level, maybe not military, at least economic. But nor, on the other hand, would a lot of peasants with uh, pitchforks and spades. And we're not talking about peasants. We're talking about uh, a highly sophisticated, highly urban industrial society. And it seems to me its best method of, method of defense would be its political appeal to the uh, working class in the, uh, uh, in the countries that were part of the attack. That's part. But again, I don't want to be glib. It might need tanks. It might need armies. And if it does... I think we can be fairly sure that that would contribute to the possible failure or at least decline of the uh, revolutionary force for exactly the reasons you mentioned. That is, I think it's extremely hard to imagine how, a, uh, uh, how a, an effective centralized army deploying tanks, planes, strategic weapons, and so on could function. If that's what's required to preserve the revolutionary structures, well, then I think they may well not be if preserved. The, if the basic defense is the political appeal, or the appeal of the political and economic organization, perhaps we could look in a little more detail at that. You wrote uh, in one of your essays that in a decent society, everyone would have the opportunity to find interesting work, and each person would be permitted the fullest possible scope for his talents. And then you went on to ask what more would be required, in particular, extrinsic reward in the form of wealth and power only if we assume that applying one's talents in interesting and socially useful work is not rewarding in itself. And I think that that line of reasoning is certainly one of the things that uh, appeals to a lot of people, but it still needs to be explained, I think, why the kind of work which people would find interesting and appealing and fulfilling to do would coincide at all closely with the kind of work which, as it were, needs to be done if we're to sustain anything like the standard of living which people mm -hmm. demand and are used to. Well, there's a certain amount of work that just has to be done if we were to maintain that standard of living. Uh, it's an open question how onerous that work has to be. Let's recall that uh, science and technology and intellect have not been devoted to examining that question or to overcoming the onerous and self-destructive character of the necessary work of society. The reason is that it has always been assumed that there is a substantial body of wage slaves who will do it simply because otherwise they'll starve. However, if human intelligence is uh, turned to the question of how to make the necessary work of society itself meaningful, we don't know what the answer will be. My, my guess is that a fair amount of it can be made uh, entirely tolerable. Uh, it's a mistake to think that uh, uh, even backbreaking physical labor is necessarily onerous. Many people I included, do it for relaxation. Uh, if it's under our own control, uh, part-time and so on. Well, this weekend, for example, I got it into my head to plant 34 trees in a meadow out behind the house, for example, from the State Conservation Commission, which meant I had to dig 34 holes in the sand. Well, that's, you know, for me and uh, what I do with my time, mostly pretty hard work, but I have to admit I enjoyed it. Uh, I wouldn't have enjoyed it if I'd had work norms, if I'd had an overseer, if I'd been ordered to do it at a certain moment, uh, and so on. On the other hand, if it's a, a task taken out of just interest, fine, that can be done. And I think that a good, and that's without any technology, without any, you know, without any uh, uh, thought given to how to design the work and well, so on. You know. I, I put it to you that there may be a danger that this view of things is a, 
rather romantic uh, mm. delusion entertained only by a small elite of people who happen, like professors, perhaps journalists mm. and so on, to be in the very privileged situation of having jobs in the sense that they are paid yeah. to do what any way okay. they like to do. That's why I began with a big if. I said we first have to ask to what extent would the, let's call it the necessary work of society, namely that work which is required to maintain the standard of living that we want. Question, first question is to what extent need this be onerous and undesirable? That's an unknown question, I think much less than it is today. But let's assume there is some extent to which it remains onerous. Well, in that case, the answer is quite simple. That work simply has to be shared has to be equally shared among people capable of doing it. Uh, and and beyond spends that, a certain number of months a year working on a automobile production line and a certain number that, of years if, collecting the garbage. And If it turns out that these are really tasks which people will find no self-fulfillment in. Incidentally, I don't quite believe that. Mm. 